Good evening. Thank you for joining us on this opportunity to meet the author of the book. We've been reading and discussing The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. I'm Clarissa Ross, one of the organizers of the Grace Bible Church, NEA, Big Read, St. Louis. And I would also like to mention my team, Herschel Durham and Dr. Nikki Spots. On behalf of the NEA Big Read St. Louis Committee, Grace Bible Church, and Pastor Ulysses Ross III, we would like to welcome you. We have two wonderful moderators for this evening to interview our author. Our first moderator is Sandra, excuse me, Sonia Venerable, and she is an administrative assistant for the Office of Community Development for St. Louis County. She has a master's degree from Lindenwood in Communications and Media Studies and a master's of fine arts in writing. She is a master of many skills such as graphic design, photography, playing the guitar, keyboard, and baking cakes. Our second uh, moderator would be Lauren Edison, and she is an educator, facilitator, and an army officer. Teaching and training is her passion. She's been in education, in education for eight years and in the army reserves for 12 years. Leading and training in both capacities, she is willing to volunteer and to support the cause. Lauren will now introduce our author. We hope that you enjoy your evening. Thank you, Sister Ross, for the introduction and um, telling a little bit about the moderators. And like she said, I'm going to introduce our author for the evening, Sandra Cicero Neros. Um, she has actually been in education as well. She was a teacher, she was a counselor, and she worked with students in all areas except for preschool and high school. She also worked as a college recruiter and as an administrator. The book that we're focusing on that she wrote is The House on Mongo Street, and that's just one of many books that she has written. The House on Mongo Street was published in 1984, and since then, she has sold over 6 million copies and has been published and written in 25 languages. Um, just a little more information about her. Um, I actually went through her about Ming section, and there's so much to know about her. She's a has accomplished many things and had many accolades. But just to name a few, um, she's recently received the Fed Frederick Douglass 200 Award. And she also received uh, many honors from universities in the world. Um, she's also, um, she also, I'm sorry. <laughs> but she has also been honored um, by um, um, Barack Obama most recently. And Hi, Lauren. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm speaking to you from Mexico City. Oh, thank you. I'm in Florissant, Missouri. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just to get started, um, just a light question. I would like to ask you, um, what was your thinking when you decided to write the book? Uh, what were you thinking for the readers? And, you know, why did you feel as though this book would be useful to our readers? Okay. Well, um, you have to take into account that I started this book when I was 22 years old. And I didn't, I was almost, uh, you know, at the end of my education, I was in graduate school. And I finished it when I was 28, thanks to a National Endowment for the Arts grant. So we've made full circle Thanks to the NEA, I finished, I got to quit my job and finish the book. And now all these years later, I'm 67, uh, you know, I'm, I'm visiting you all. And uh, the, the book began from a moment when I was in a classroom and we were talking about our homes, our houses. And it was the very first time that I ever was aware, I'm almost done with my education and we've never talked about economic class. We've never mentioned it. 
And I didn't realize that I was carrying within me a, a, a feeling of shame about the neighborhood I came from, from the house I came from. I didn't realize I was carrying this until we had the seminar where we talked about our homes. And it was the first time I woke up and realized I didn't have the kind of house that you see on television shows, that you see in the movies, uh, and that my home and my community had never been written about in, in a way that was accurate, in a way that was portraying my community with love. I'd never seen anything, not a magazine ad or a film or a book in the library. And uh, my first reaction was, oh, my God, I, I should quit this program. Why did I think I should be here? I'm not smart enough. I don't have what these other kids have. So I went into a, a funk for a couple of days, and I questioned whether I should be in a graduate program trying to be a writer. I was four hours and a half away from home, first time away from home, and uh, I just had doubts. But the wonderful thing about this depression for me is that the other side of the depression was anger. Because once I got through being sad, I started getting angry. And anger is a very under-evaluated emotion, I have to say. A lot of times we um, aim that anger at those around us, or worse, ourselves. And we create violent words, violent actions. But this time, I used my anger to do something positive. I said, I'm going to stay in school. I'm going to finish my MFA. And I'm going to write the book that should be in the library. And that's how House was born. It was initiated from this sense of outrage that I hadn't seen my community, my home written about with love. And I did begin it with, with shame. But by the time I finished the book, I came to some completely different place, just like the protagonist. You know, she comes in just saying, oh, this neighborhood is terrible. I don't want to belong here. But by the end of the book, you know, she's fallen in love with the people from the community and she has a mission. So that all came to me as uh, the 22 to 28, very crucial time in a woman's life. And, you know, it's just an awakening for me about myself. Many books and many people, including my students, came into the story and helped to wake me up and shape the book. Because like Esperanza, I didn't know which way to go, but I knew which way I did not want to go. So. I was discovering, like she is, her her direction. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I would say um, your response it really resonates with a lot of people, and I think the times that we're going through now um, that really hits home. You know, a lot of people are experiencing depression, especially a lot of shame. So that's really mm -hmm. fitting. Thank yes. you for sharing. And, you know, one of the things that people don't realize, and I'm going to say to this community specifically, you know, uh, when I was leaving uh, my graduate school experience, a friend of mine took me to see the autobiography of Malcolm X, the documentary, and then I read the book, and I was like so awakened by that book that it became the text I used to help my students who were having reading issues. We, we read huh. reading book. That was my text of choice. But for me, it was so um, enlightening that character Esperanza renames herself. It's influenced by uh, Malcolm X's book. And she names herself ZZ the X. That X is from autobiography of Malcolm X, an awakening in me of feeling like as women, that we also inherit names that aren't ours. We're inheriting, you know, a, a patriarchal name, and we don't know our real name. So that's, I want to just tie that in to how uh, the book for me as a young girl who didn't know my own history as a Mexican-American began that search during the time I was writing this book. Wow, that's amazing how that all comes full circle. Thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah, and then like, you know, everything else would follow, you know, that, that I would start learning about uh, the civil rights movement of the Black civil rights movement, how that allowed me to go to college. And I started learning about Latina feminism because the uh. white feminist movement didn't make sense to me. You know, everything started, uh, you know, actually when I was leaving college is when I started learning the most. And <laughs> I've never stopped searching. You know, it's like right. when you start realizing, hey, how come I didn't get taught this? <laughs> and you start like, you know, digging in the rubble and looking in the footnotes and searching your entire life. I'm 67. I'm still not done searching. I'm still learning. 
And it's all because a lot of the history that we have to learn as women, as people of color, as people who have been colonized and have also have colonizer blood in us too. Yes, you know, yes. We've got to we've got to uncover our history yes. and we have to look in like the margins for our story because it's not being taught to us. Yes. yes. Okay, I guess I'm I'm on now. <laughs> okay, so we polled a lot of people. And the first question, one of the most popular questions that came up was about the rice sandwich. Uh, people wanted to know what type of rice and what type of bread would Esperanza's <laughs> mother have had? <laughs> well, let me tell you, that chapter is autobiographical. So I'm going to tell you the real. Uh, you know, I always say all, all the parts of the story where Esperanza is smart. And she does something that is like really bigger than most human beings. That's what I wish I would have done. But all the ones where, you know, it's embarrassing, those that happened to me. So that one about the sandwich in, in real life, you know, my mother wasn't, a, we didn't have a lot of money and we ate a lot of poor people's food. So we ate white wonder bread, you know, the okay. kind of spongy bread, <laughs> not very nutritional. And, you know, kind of rice we had because we were Mexican was Spanish rice, you know, made with tomato sauce and fried. So you can imagine what that looked like, a white bread after a couple, couple hours. <laughs> well, not very tasty looking. And, you know, it kind of made the bread all smushed and stained. And it was very starchy. But that's what we had in the fridge. And, okay. <laughs> Did you want to ask me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that sounds good. I actually have a student, and she always talks about making Spanish bread. So I think we have to try to make it now. <laughs> Let's see. So, Sandra, you, um, Sandra, you also talked about women and not knowing our names and um, where they mm -hmm. came from. But one question we have is, what's the significance of women and looking out of windows? Well, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that many of us, maybe all of us can remember women in our neighborhood who spend a lot of time looking out at the world, maybe because they didn't want to look inside. Yeah. And uh I was I was uh, lived in a neighborhood where we were all pressed together. So even if you thought you were anonymous, people were watching you, especially the women in the neighborhood. They were all watching you and telling sometimes they'd shout and say, you think you should leave that bike there? I wouldn't leave that there if I were you. <laughs> you had all this chorus of women that were watching out from the window. Some of them in real life were like uh, the characters that they couldn't come out. They were locked in and had a lower shopping bag. Or some of them were just, uh, you know, like women that uh, based on a lot of the stories are based on real people I knew who uh, would, would not be very satisfied with the life they had and, you know, spend a lot of time looking out, sometimes making commentary to the children, because the children spend a lot of time on the sidewalk, or at least they, they did then when, when I was growing up. Um, right now I'm working with a collaborator, a, a composer named Derek Bermel, and we're making an opera of House Among the Street. And we have all the women in the window as being the chorus. They're the ones that are out there commenting on the scenes, saying things. And uh, my idea is that they should be carrying window frames or screen doors was usually when you see women that's that's where you see them they're kind of like locked in uh not allowed to go out or can't go far because of their responsibilities mm -hmm. okay although much of your book details experiences outside of the house why did you choose the house on mango street as the title uh well in real life that neighborhood that this book is based on was named was named after a real house, a real neighborhood, a real street. And the real street that my house was on was called Campbell Street. Okay. And there's a picture of it, of the real house, in my book, A House of Her Own. You can see what the house really looked like. But I couldn't name it Campbell Street because of the soup. And I had to think of something that sounds like Campbell but doesn't have anything to do with Campbell. So, you know, I kept saying it in my head, Campbell, Campbell. And then I, I thought of things that reminded me of Mexico and my favorite fruit is a mango. And, and there really is in Chicago, a mango avenue, but I didn't know that. At the time, you, you couldn't Google anything like that. Uh, so I just said Mango Street and I, I had no idea that real 
people would someday ask me about the real Mango Avenue in Chicago or about Mango Streets in their city. Okay. I wasn't so good at lying when I was a young writer, you know? <laughs> I had to base things on reality. So that's why I had to lie to myself to get something that sounded like Campbell but had nothing to do with Campbell. Huh. That's, that's actually really brilliant. This well, you know, a lot of, you know, when you begin, that's, that's how you go. You don't know that you can invent. Right. This, this question actually had a second part, so I'm gonna continue that if, if that's all right with Lauren. Um, but it asks, what does it reveal about your connection to your family, your home and your neighborhood? My book? Yes. Well, I guess I should ask the readers that. I, I think that, uh, um, my family is a very close, was a very close one. My mother and father are gone now, mm -hmm. but they're still here in spirit. Uh, and I, I think my mom, especially, you know, she grew up uh, with parents who couldn't read or write from the countryside in Mexico who fled the Mexican Civil War. So uh, she she learned English and her parents couldn't help her with their, her schoolwork. She was a young girl who quit school at, after she started ninth grade because mm -hmm. she felt ashamed of her clothes, just like the character's mother in the book. And she always regretted that, my mom. She regretted that she didn't have an education. She always instilled in us, her seven children, that it, it's so important to go to school and uh, women especially need it, have independence. And, you know, my mom just was one of those uh, people that uh, pushed us to study, took us to the library on Saturdays, took us to the museums, took us to concerts, anything that was free for nine people to go to, we were there. And so she was, uh, you know, her hunger for learning was something that uh, opened a path for all of us. My dad also, uh, he was different. He came to this country during the uh, Second World War and was drafted, served in the army, became a U.S. citizen. He was not as creative as my mom. Uh, and my mom was really the brain of the operation. But my father also regretted that he had quit his first semester at university. He came from mm. a middle class. He didn't come from country people like my mom. He was from uh, urban Mexico City, middle class. Grandfather, my grandfather was a army man, colonel. So my, my father could have had a better life if he had stayed in Mexico. But because he ran away from his father uh, after the first semester in college, he had very bad grades. And my grandfather was a military man, very strict. My father was afraid of his father. And he vagabonded north, wound up uh, getting drafted uh, because he had false papers and served in the army under a false identity for half of his term. I don't know how he straightened it out, but he did. Became a US citizen and always regretted that he hadn't finished his studies. He hadn't faced his father and gone to school. He would have had a, an easier life, but he learned a trade, became an upholster, worked with his hands and, and told us, you know, use this, don't use this. And he would show us his hands. They were all scarred. Yeah. And, you know, so you got a team of a mom who wished she went to school, dad who regretted he didn't go to school. And that's that was um, that was a gift they gave us of that, you know, got to study, got to go to school. And uh, I don't think any other family in our block had that combination of determined parents. Right. To make, make sure that was something You know, like my mom never made me learn how to make tortillas or change a diaper. Mm. I still don't know how to make coffee. <laughs> okay. but my mom, when she saw me with a lot of she left me alone. I mean, I had chores. I had to wash dishes and help her clean up. But if I had a book in my hand, to her, that was more important than learning how to cook. That's great. That's yeah. really good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Sandra, I want to say the more that you tell us about your background, I see that we have so much in common mm -hmm. uh, with your family and the military background and your parents really valuing education. Um, so I'm really enjoying this interview so far. But I, um, so my next question I want to ask you, um, so you start off telling us in the house on Mongo Street and it says, I'm going to tell you a story about a girl who doesn't belong. Um, so why did she feel as though she didn't belong? 
I, I think sometimes when you're a, a studious girl, uh, you know, that it, it makes society sometimes or your neighborhood or your girlfriends or make you feel like there's something wrong with you because you like to read or you like to, you know, most artists are very introverted. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I was also an only daughter. So that also made me feel very lonely in my family because my brothers were outgoing and um, I just spent more time by myself. So I'm thinking that that's probably where that came from when I wrote that. I, I feel that sometimes as uh, artists, uh, we have a very rich inner life and society doesn't want us to go inside. They want us to come out and be join and be social. And we, we don't always understand that some children uh, need solitude and they need to nurture themselves and do well, you know? So it's, you know, my family was kind of like that. You know, if I was not a joiner, if a cousin came over, they say, put that book away, come out and be sociable. What are you doing in there by yourself? Come on out. You know, they were always shouting and making me want to do something that I didn't want to do. I just wanted to read a book. I just mm -hmm. wanted to climb a tree and think. And, you know, sometimes we don't have a space to think or we don't, encourage girl children to think yeah. you know, and we don't have room in the house and when there's televisions and radios and children sleeping in middle rooms like we did there's no place to think so for me uh, the library was a place of the imagination it wasn't just about borrowing books it was like i was finally in some place quiet and some place i felt safe and some place where i could think and you know, I, I wasn't doing nothing. I was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, my family, uh, I always felt that my family didn't understand that about me, especially my mom. She was very different from me. Uh, my father was more like me, but he was gone working a lot. And now, in retrospect, I think, wow, how did I become a writer in such a noisy family? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next question is, since the house on Mango Street, of course, we know is wonderfully portrays the young girl, Esperanza, discovering her identity. Do you think that like such self-discovery is harder for a young Latina, Latina girl? And would Esperanza's story be different if she were growing up today? Well, I think it's hard for everybody to grow up, don't you, Sonia? <laughs> yes, I, I do. Think I think growing up is just hard. And, you know, it, it's hard. It's, it's going to be hard anytime. It's hard now. It's hard when we were kids. Yeah. Uh, I think in, regardless of what color you are, it's just leaving childhood and going into adulthood. I'm always fascinated by that time because you're still like a kid, but you still yeah. feel like an adult. And maybe you're an adult one day and then two days later you feel like a kid. You're, there's this magical time you know, that you're moving back and forth from. I tried to write about that. You know, like Esperanza wants to run with, with Lucy and Rachel, who are younger, but she's also very attracted to Sally and her power with boys, but that's also scary, you know? So all of that, you know, there's, a, I thought about that, that time in my life. And I also was a teacher with high school dropouts. I had girls who, and boys who had very difficult lives, harder than mine. And so I was weaving their stories into my neighborhood of my past and my students would remind me of like maybe a cousin or a classmate i knew and then i started uh braiding their stories together and so maybe i would take three different people and two other people and put them together to make a character and that's when my book started becoming a fiction even though it's based on real strands uh, we call it fiction because it's not taken from a whole whole uh, intact from memory. So I you know I, I think I think, think teenage years are really hard for every human being and uh, especially if you're living in a community where you don't have a lot of resources or it's very fixed about how you should be as a girl and very fixed about how you should be as a boy and there's not a lot of leeway in, in our society but maybe that's true even if you're a kid in china i don't know i didn't grow up in china but i can imagine and it must be very very hard for everybody you know yes i agree yeah and you know and it's especially hard if uh, you're a very shy child uh you're a child who can't express themselves 
and defend yourself. I was one of those girls yeah. that never could talk in school right. and uh, now I'm making up for it. But back then I didn't talk and I felt very uh, shy and ashamed. Um, I had a lot of issues about uh, my clothes. I had issues about like my nose. You know, I love my nose now, but back then I didn't see it on a magazine cover. Right, you right. Know? I had issues about like, you know, was I smart enough? Maybe I wasn't smart. You mm. know, there's a lot of very deep issues that uh, affect yeah. young young people. Yes. Especially you want to look like everybody else. You want right. to be accepted. And mm. uh, I, I, I just remember... Uh, how difficult that was. I'm sure it's it's just as hard, if not more difficult now with social media. Yes. And the bullying and the posts and things people say. You know, I don't know that I could survive uh, the things that you see posted now. Right. Yes, I agree. Yes, I completely agree with you, Sandra. Um, I'll say I actually teach in high school now, so I see mm -hmm. a lot of what you're saying and um, our middle schools and high schoolers are going through a lot. So I can completely yeah. resonate with what you're saying. Um, but I want to tap into what you were saying about the book and how you decided to create the characters and how you weave some of them together. And then also, I would like to know what made you decide to do the vignettes. I'll say we thoroughly enjoyed the vignettes. Yeah. But yeah. What made you you know, I, I was in the poetry workshop when I started writing this book. So I, I was actually a, a writer of prose and poetry. But because when I applied for the, for graduate school, I had more poems under my belt. That's what I, I got into. I didn't know that you could apply for both. And I didn't have enough training in both. So by the time I started the book, um, I was reading works that look like a cross between poetry and fiction. Right reading little vignettes and I hadn't come across uh, books like uh, the ones I mentioned in the introduction like Gwendolyn Brooks, Maud Martha or uh, Kanek by a Central American writer or Lilus Kikus by a Mexican writer. These are all story cycles and I didn't come into contact with them until I was older. So I thought I was just inventing and I, I knew in my head that I wanted to write something that you could open it up at any book, any, any page rather and you could read one. But if you wanted to, you could read it from left to right, and there'd be another story going on from left to right. I was thinking about how like people like my mom or my father or people that drive buses or people who are hairstylists, you know, they don't have a lot of time. So I was thinking like maybe if, if I could write these little pearls in a necklace and that people who don't have a lot of time could just read one. And, so busy. You know, <laughs> You know, because I, I like reading one page stories and mm -hmm. those are hard to write because you've got to get everything in there and it's got to, mm -hmm. last line's got to fly. It's mm -hmm. got to be like a poem. The last line doesn't end on the page. It, it ends in here. You got to mm -hmm. think about it. And that's what I was trying to do by, by writing the vignettes. Okay, it's really good. So I'm going to jump down to the red clown chapter. Uh, does Esperanza, <laughs> does she ever tell her parents about what happened in the Red Clown chapter? That's you know I'm what? Talking. I'm glad you asked about that because that's the hardest. That was the hardest chapter for me to write. I don't read it unless I have to. Like when I recorded, I recorded the book for audio. It was really hard for me to read that chapter. And now I'm working on it uh, with, with Derek Vermel as the opera and we had to think, how do we portray the scene? Because, you know, as a counselor, anyone who has been a counselor to young people, you know that a lot of times they don't tell you the whole story. Yes. They talk around a story. People dodge what has happened to them because they're trying to deny it. Right. And I, I was trying to write a story about uh, someone who won't talk to me. So that was kind of hard. And uh, I, I, I don't know... You know, I want to believe, you know, we have to, the thing is that this book, you have to fill in the blanks. There are interstices between the stories where your interpretation, you have to think about it and talk about it with others. If you can argue your point of view, it's, it's fine. I don't have one definitive way of saying she did this, she did that. Mm -hmm. I, I try to write just enough so that the story can take off in, in your heart. 
and then you can dialogue about it. So you, you can make all kinds of alternatives of what happened between that chapter and the next. And um, for us in the opera, that, that scene is one of the climax of the opera. I don't want to give away too much because we're, we're still haven't performed it. We're still like rehearsing and uh, this summer we're going to rehearse. And, and But um, it's a difficult uh, scene to write. I don't say exactly what has happened. And we hope when we do the stage project, production that it's suggested like the text so that you have to use your imagination through lighting, perhaps, that it could be suggested. And um, I think the issue of violence and especially uh, sexual violence yeah. is one that's so important because uh, it's a lot of times we shy away from talking about it. And I'm happy that the book is being used in many uh, places that I didn't imagine it be used at so that women would have language to talk about their own issues. Yeah, because there's so many women that have those issues. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, um, thank you for sharing that. I'll say during our book discussion, we interpreted your vignette so many different ways. So. And, and, you know, and, and everybody's right. There's, I like to tell students, isn't it great? There's no wrong answer. You know, you can read it how you read it and your own life is going to shape how you see this book. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. Um, so we actually have a question from our audience that's watching. Yeah. Um, it's on the screen right now. And she said, I love that you talked about the parallel relationship between your personal progression and the book progression with everything you experienced and know now, what would you tell your younger self? This is an awesome question. Ooh, that's that's cool. a good question. <laughs> um, <I mean. laughs> uh, you know, uh, I wish that I had learned earlier my history of my people, that I had known how connected I am to so many other groups in the United States that I had wish I had known my DNA, that my mother's people were illiterate people. I didn't know that till I was an adult. I wish I had known that they were migrant farm workers when they came to the United States. Uh, you know, these are things I learned on, you know, finding your roots when I was on the show. Uh, I wish I had known uh, a history of indigenous people in the United States and that I'm on my mother's side, like over 50 percent, you know, we have that that DNA in us. I wish I had searched from my, the history of, of women and of working class people and of people of color earlier that I had gotten that earlier. I mean, it, it came to me eventually little bits and pieces and I'm still learning. But I feel there's so much history that we don't get. Uh, as people of color, as working class people, as women. And we have to search for it ourselves. We have to create those book groups. We have to create, like my friends do, have you read this book? Have you seen this movie? To help educate ourselves. Because a lot of our education has been like a complete education of just the European and colonizers history. We're not we're not getting our own history. Or we're getting a very um, warped version of our history. So I feel like now that I'm older, I'm reading books that I, I wish I'd known about. You know, there's so many things that I wish I'd known about, but I'm learning them now. And and maybe if they had come earlier, I might not have been ready to understand them. I, I do think books are medicine. And yes. every book is a prescription. And sometimes people say, oh, read this book. And I'm, I'm not ready for that medicine. Right. <laughs> so it's not the book's fault. Sometimes I'm just not ready. And we have to give it a chance later on. Mm, that's awesome. It's it is. all in the timing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always, I'm, you know, I hesitate sometimes when people say, what are you reading? And I hesitate because this is my prescription. It would be like I gave you my glasses and say, here, try reading with these. <laughs> You know, they might. <laughs> you might say, "Oh, they give me a headache." So you know, uh, it, it books are medicine. I don't like books that say these are the best fifty American poems for you. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's a very good analogy of that. That is really beautiful. 
Yeah, it's true. You know, so true. You know, think about what was your favorite book when you were 15 or nine or 35 or 45. You know, it changes. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're, that was your prescription at that time. That was the medicine that nourished you at that time. Yes, books are medicine. Okay. Where were you when you wrote Alicia Who Sees Mice? Oh, I know exactly where I was. Uh, I was a counselor at my alma mater, Loyola University. And one of my young women uh, students at the uh, freshman in college, mm -hmm. she was explaining to me what a hard time she had uh, because of her father. And, you know, her father who was not college educated, didn't understand how many hours she needed to put in, unlike high school, to just keep up. You know, she had to stay up late and get up early. Um, the part about the tortillas I took from my mother's friend uh, who had to, you know, that wasn't part of my student story. That was part of my mother's friend when she, her best friend had to get up early every day and make the whole family. None of the store bought. She had to make fresh flour tortillas for the whole family before she went to school. So I took these two stories and put them together. And maybe I put a third story and that's my fear of, of mice in there. because <laughs> That's my kryptonite. So I put that all in there. And I just felt uh, listening to this young student's story, uh, her pain, because, uh, you know, she wants to obey and please her father but she also can't explain to him how difficult and different being in college is from being in high school. Hmm. Thank you. Let's see, so everyone is so excited about this interview. I'm getting questions um, in the chat on my phone and Good. I'm just trying to decide like, what should we ask? But yeah, and also if people, if people <laughs> think of a question later and say, oh, I should have asked her, you can still reach me on my website, www.sandracisnetos.com. There's a letters, you know, that you can write to me and uh, ask me things and I do answer all my mail. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I just received a question and it's about the colors and how they're used in the book. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of reference to red green, mm -hmm. yellow, and blue. Oh, there mm -hmm. it is right there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know how when you go to sleep, you have a dream and you dream and you wake up, you think, oh, that's very interesting. And, but you don't know what dream means. You have to go to the wise neighbor lady or the therapist to tell you what it means. Well, my stories, when details like that, I, I don't know what it means. You have to tell me what I meant because I just dreamed the dream, but you analyze my dream. Ah. Wow. Okay. I, when you right. go to bed, you don't think I'm going to dream a dream with red, green, and yellow. You just dream. <laughs> Sounds like a flag. Yeah, but but you know what it means. You know, I, I think that there are meanings there. That's why we have critics and students who analyze stories. I just don't know it because I haven't I haven't uh, analyzed it deep enough myself. Mm, I like that, and I'm sure as the students have read the book in middle school and high school, it has gone so many different ways and interpreted. Yeah. Yeah. I like the questions that the children ask me because they're not scared to ask questions. You know. <laughs> Like they'll ask me things like, how many years have you been wearing glasses? <laughs> <laughs> so those are cute questions that I, I like because no reporter is ever going to ask me that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see. How well, long? Things we were talking about before that I want to remind this audience oh, okay. Uh, before we started taping, was that you have to remember House on Longa Street is not a Latino neighborhood. Wow. There are people of all colors. And when I'm working on the opera now, I've had to remind uh, my collaborator, you know, this is going to be a very multicultural cast because in real life, my neighborhood wasn't a Latino neighborhood. I never say that. It was a mixed neighborhood that was Black, Puerto Rican, Appalachian, Ukrainian, Polish. Uh, you know, we just had all these different kinds of communities that were all living on the same block because it was cheap, not because they wanted to live next to right. each other. And, you know, a lot of the changing neighborhoods, I like that. You know, when the story begins, Kathy's moving out. So, you know, people are moving in because the, the rent is low or the mortgage is low or whatever. So, uh, you know, I want to remind people that, that if you read this story correctly, you will see that there's lots of different uh, 
kinds of people living on this block. Okay. Um, one of the questions that was asked is, how long did it take you to get the house you wanted? Oh, well, <laughs> all right. Now you have to not confuse the protagonist with the author because the author was writing from uh, her autobiographical neighborhood and then she started changing this autobiographical neighborhood to incorporate her students as she was discovering her path and her, her uh, profession and her politics, yeah. and her, her education. You know, she, she made her, her little character be the little puppet so to, to kind of explore things that she in her life. But I never expected that people were going to confuse me with the character. That, that's mm -hmm. how naive I was. And, uh, you know, I didn't, and the book is really not about a physical house, although that's what Esperanza wants, but she's really looking for a, 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 a creative space of her own, you know, some place that she, it, it, you know, she thinks that it's, it's a house, but it's really more than that. And uh, I, so I hope readers will understand that. As for me, however, I, I never expected to own a house because I was a writer and I was an English teacher and I was college recruiter and I was the director of an arts program and I never made a lot of money. Wow. So I never expected to own a house. And uh, I was also like a part-time professor, one semester here, one semester there. I, I just wasn't in, you know, I just thought, you know, if I'm lucky, uh, I'll, ha I'll have a job as a teacher and I'll have summers off. Uh, that was, you know, and, and if I'm lucky in the summertime, I can write. So I never expected to own a house. And uh, I moved to San Antonio, Texas because of a job. And when I was about 40, I was encouraged by my accountant and my agent that I should buy a house. So that was a good time for me to buy a house. And I thanked those two women because I was a single woman. I was freelancing. I never made the same amount every year. And I was scared. And they told me, you can do it. Buy a house. This is a good time for you to buy a house in Texas. And I thought, really? You think I can pay for it every year? Yes, get it. And I would never have, it, it just was not in my math, you know. And uh, so the first year I paid for my house, I wrote on the envelope with mortgages. And I paid for my house one year. And I just did it. And um you know, I, I, I bought my house. I bought the house across the street. I built an office. You know, I just kept earning and earning. And then I started earning from my pen. Is that crazy? You know, I started quit my day job. I could start writing. And I've been earning from my pen since 1995. My father wanted me to get married because he saw me come to Chicago without a dollar in my pocket. And he reminded me of that. And he always wanted me to get married because he thought I just couldn't handle money. Wow. And uh, when I started earning money, especially when I won the MacArthur grant, which is like the big lottery prize, the MacArthur Foundation grant, my father saw that check and he said, Miha, daughter, don't get married. He'll just take your money away from you. <laughs> so my father lived long enough to understand, you know, what I would have been after all those years, you know, and, uh, I have a lot of gratitude that my father survived to see my success. So now I live, now I, now I sold that house in Texas and I live in San Miguel de Allende and uh, I'm still the most surprised when I unlocked the door that I own my house and I paid for it with this. Wow. I'm the most astonished. I'm, I could not have invented this story. I agree. It's a beautiful story, and I'm sure so many people listening can I see this. I feel very story. blessed. I get thanks every day. Mm -hmm. I This is full circle. You know, the grant that the NEA gave me allowed me to quit my day job and finish the book. And look at all these years later, I'm talking to communities across the globe. I, I feel in my heart that uh, I did something with uh, pure love. I wrote it with love, with no, yes. no agenda, no ego. And I think that's the secret of the universe. Whatever we create with love, on behalf of those we love, with no personal agenda, with no ego, is always going to turn out well. 
you get something sometimes better than fame and glory. You get something better. Yes. It might not be what you think, but I truly believe whatever we invest our whole heart in with pure love on behalf of those we love is always going to bring us something beautiful. Yes. That's what I learned. That's what House taught me. Okay. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we actually have another question from the audience. Uh, and they ask, actually ask, when did you start writing? I started writing when I was 11 years old. And uh, I started uh, in secret. I would read poetry in my textbook. And I also was the artist in the class. You know, I drew, but I started uh, writing with, you know, drawing with words uh, around 11. But but not showing it to anyone. It was just a secret, and I did that on my own uh, all through middle school. Okay, thank you. I'm sure that's really motivating for our. I have to mention. I have to mention here. Uh, there was a very wonderful teacher. When I was in the eleventh grade, we changed schools from a school where I was terrified to speak because I thought that what I had to say was uh, wrong or stupid so i never raised my hand and then we changed schools thanks to the water pipes bursting in our house just like the character in esperanza this was a very bad deep freeze in chicago in 1966 and we moved to another neighborhood my father uh, borrowed begged got the money for a down payment and it was the house the house on manga streets based on we went to a school where there were some very kind educators, very kind woman teacher whose name I'm sorry, I don't remember, but I can't forget her. And uh, she gave me something that I needed. And you know, when a teacher loves you, and she just nourished me with a lot of love, and brought out the brought me out from being shy, I started raising my hand, I started trying, she complimented me, I had never been complimented before in school. Uh, she complimented me on my drawings and she made me feel good about myself. And I, at first I thought she was um, made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I thought I had little blue glasses from the Sears, little pointing. I thought she, she had mistaken me for a smart girl. Wow. And I felt, uh, I felt sorry for her. <laughs> so I said, oh, she thinks I'm smart. So uh, I started raising my hand and I moved from C's to uh, B's and subsequently from B's to uh, A's the next couple of years. Thanks to this teacher. All right. I think we're right at the end of our interview. Oh, so first of all, I would like to tell you, we truly appreciate you taking out time out of your evening to do this interview with us today and participating in our NEA Big Read discussion. Well, I believe we, can all say that we enjoy reading and discussing your work of art with you. This was actually my book. I personally look forward to reading more work of yours. Oh, please, please, yes. please. I have, I have 13 books. 13 and uh, books. Uh, yeah, and my newest one is called Martita, I Remember You. And uh, I, I also, if people want to see the difference between my life and my work, you can look at a book called A House of Her Own. They are uh, essays, nonfiction with photos. You can see the real house of Manga Street and you can see my life story compared to uh, house of Manga Street, which sometimes, you know, there are elements of my life in there. But if you really want to see my life, you, you can look at House of My Own. You can get it in the library. And um, you can also, all my books are on audio. If you'd prefer to hear me read them, uh, I record all of my books. And I love recording them. So you'll have a good time. You can get those at the library too. I think. Does library have audio books now? I think they yes, do. Yes, they do. Yeah. Before we end, Lauren, there's another question. Did you want to ask? Yes. One more question before we go. Um, we had a lot of questions that were asked about the hair and the vignette about the hair. Yes. Um, let's see. The, the questions are changing, but we want to finish with that one because we thoroughly enjoyed that chapter. Now, that, that's a picture book that we made ca uh, called Hairs, too, because my friend who illustrated that book worked with uh, uh, first graders. And she said that the children liked that chapter a lot. They would memorize it. So she had suggested that we work together and do a picture book, which we did. 
And, you know, I, I wrote that chapter because I wanted the reader to know the names of the characters. That's the reason mm-hmm. I wrote it, you know, just to figure out who's, who's the characters, what are their names, you know, and that's why I wrote the chapter. But it also is very true to many families who have, you know, you can be in one family, you could have totally different kinds of hairs. And mm-hmm. certainly that was the case in my family where you had people that had curly hair and some people that had hair like corn silk and some people had wavy hair and some people had hair like a broom. You know, that was my family because we had nine people. And so I, I tried to, you could tell I wasn't adept at handling many characters. So the family in Esperanza has only, there's only four children. Unlike my family, they had seven kids, cousins coming in, aunties, uncles, grandmother. grandmother. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to handle that. But you can see in my next novel, Caramelo, I put everybody in there. And okay. So take a look at take a look at that. Caramelo. That's okay. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna read next thing. And if you can do listen to the audio because I had a lot of fun uh, recording it. Okay. And, uh, you, you can listen to it in your car or wherever you are. It, it, it's fun. It's oh, fun. Really? Yeah. Thank you so much. I no, had so no. much fun. Again, I want to say what an honor it is to be in your community at this time in history. I think your town will live on in history. And I am so, um, grace is the word, because Grace Bible Church is sponsoring this. I really feel I am graced with uh, so much love and good fortune. And I thank you for uh, including my book in your community. It's an honor. Oh, thank you again. Like I said, we really appreciate it. We'd also like to take this time to thank all of our listeners that participated today and ask you to also be a part of our NEA Big Read closing celebration next Saturday, March 12th, featuring the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. This event will be at Grace Bible Church located at 1912 Central Parkway in Florissant, Missouri. The zip code is 63031 if you need to put it in your map and mask are required for this event. Always remember when you read, you exercise your comprehension abilities and your analytical abilities. It fires up your imagination and stimulates the memory centers of your mind. It helps recall information as well as stabilize your emotions. The importance of a reading habit is that it strengthens mental muscles. So go forth and read. (laughs) Thank you so much for the power of books. There's one thing that once you have knowledge, no one can take that away. No one can take it away from you, man. That's right. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Sonia. And and thank your community for uh, sending my book out to the people who need to read it. I really do believe books are medicine. And I hope this book helped to heal and nourish your community. Yes, yes. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank and you if you so have much. more questions, don't forget, I got my website. I'll answer your letters. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yes. Saludos. Adios. Bye. <laughs> God bless everyone. <laughs>